Hello, everyone. I'm Leilani Cawthon with the Learning Council, CEO and publisher here, also a proud EduJedi Grandmaster. Uh, we have uh, our virtual digital transition discussion now for uh, DC, Virginia, West Virginia. Um, today and tomorrow, we're recording so we can make sure we get it out to everyone. Um, I want to make sure that everyone knows you can uh, raise your hand at any time, ask questions. We want to feel like, you know, there's a little bit of conversation going on during the course of the day. So ask questions, raise your little digital hand or type something in at any time. Doug is with me today to help me uh, moderate. I want to also thank our sponsors today, ClassLink, Scholastic Digital Solutions, Cisco, Learning.com, and Renaissance. And this is the way the day is going to roll. First, we'll have with us um, Ms. Maury Pace, who's the coordinator of Innovative Learning. Um, I don't know why we have also Suzanne Sloan on here. I don't think she's going to join us for this part of the hour, but um, later she will be joining us. Um, then we'll do our lunch and learn with Megan, who's got a lot of news from ClassLink, and then um, Mary Schlegelmilk uh, and Shannon Red from Cisco are going to be talking about what's happening with them. There's a lot of new things going on with hybrid learning um, that are impacting networks, and we want people to know about what's going on there. Then I will um, do the whole keynote on the learning leadership versus systemic e inequities, which there's a lot of data the Learning Council has pulled from our national research that you'll need to hear, um, as well as what's going on with school model shift, which is very interesting. And then we'll follow that um, with Wendy Allman uh, giving a, a, a little bit of conversation about what's going on with Renaissance. Then we'll go into what's happening with the hybrid logistics project, have a video showcase and end the day with Maury Pace again and Suzanne Sloan on our panel to talk about um, the lessons they've learned in digital and also what's going on with their models and um, hybrid discussion. So that's our day for today. So I want to make sure we introduce um, Ms. Maury Pace. So good to have you. Well, thank you. And did you want me to um, share my slides? Or yes, I'm going to stop that? sharing and to focus attention on you, I'm going to go off camera. Um, and have you do your intro and share um, what's happening for you. Wonderful. Well, I am Maury Pace. I'm the coordinator of Innovative Learning, Powhatan County. Powhatan is outside of uh, Richmond, Virginia. We're a rural division. Um, we have five schools, three elementary, one middle, one high. Um, and we are growing as we are on the edge of some of our larger uh, divisions and houses are pressing out. Uh, a little bit of my background is I did start in Maryland, I'm a social studies teacher by trade, and then I went and started um, working as an online teacher, first developing curriculum, and then um, as a full-time online teacher before this position. So I worked in the online segment for about mm, seven years as a teacher and 10 years as a curriculum designer. So when asked to talk about this, I was rattling my brain about all the different things that um, we could talk about. And I just wanted to throw out a couple of things. They have been so many leadership changes, so many model shifts. We even had um, in the division level, you know, several people are retiring, new people are coming in. Um, and so it's really always a place for change right now. And so I just wanted to show what our models have kind of been in the division and, and start that. So obviously in March of 2020, uh, we all went asynchronous as we were not allowed to uh, see each other. And so that created a, a big shift. It took about a couple of weeks for us to be able to get our elementary um, students to have their Chromebooks. Um, we were doing paper for um, and mailing them out for those first couple of weeks. And since we are a rural division, it does make it a bit difficult because we do have places in which even a cell reception is not available. Um, so then we migrated last year to the beginning of the, uh, to the beginning of the year, which was um, successful in a, um, we had a fully virtual group. And so they could actually move in and out of being virtual or being hybrid or, our elementaries were um, in person by Oc October. We had um, preschool through fifth grade fully in person unless they chose to be virtual. And then our secondary 
because of considerations like bathrooms and lunches, um, they stayed hybrid for the whole year. Our model for that was using um, an AB schedule with a Wednesday uh, break for everyone, which was a support day for students and a planning day for teachers. And then we had the summer and um, our community did want to have some in-person learning. So we actually only did in-person uh, summer school. Um, there were a couple of students that we did um, bring them in virtually, um, but it was mostly all in-person. We ran summer camps. So we tried to make it a really um, fun and robust experience. Our summer schools are based off of um, pers of we ask, we invite the students to come um, and then everybody can join for the summer camps. We also did, instead of necessarily a fully virtual model at that point in time, we chose to do um, a model where we had, we went out or virtually did uh, tutoring. So it was more of like a homeschool model um, with a one-on-one -on -one for certain students. And then this year that leads us to we do have a full virtual program, um, K through 12, but in that we are leaning more on our vendors, um, those that are providing full curriculum, or as we said, for virtual Virginia, um, which is a state run online school. And so we have many of our students that are either just taking one course or they are taking their full virtual program. It was this decision because, so that we could reduce class sizes specifically in our elementary to not have a virtual program that was led by our staff uh, so that we could have more people and make classrooms smaller, not only to reduce them for COVID, but also so that the individualized attention um, and remediation that was needed would be there. And so we are fully in person this year, unless you chose the virtual program. But with that being said, we have a division of 4,000 students and we have had um, the last school board, school board meeting I attended, we had over 600 students in the month of September that were out um, because of close contact or COVID. So we're really almost leading a little mini hybrid for those students. And I've actually um, been running some different pilots so that we could give um, school levels where elementary, middle school or high school different ways in which they can incorporate those students that are out and are not sick into their classrooms. So we've done some situations where we just have a student and, um, and they are on a, an extra Chromebook in the room um, with a Google Meet and they are getting to watch the teacher and hear the uh, group instruction. Uh, but then they work on their, um, in the LMS, at home using the other materials that the teacher has provided, just like they might be in the classroom for that practice time. Then we also have some other options where um, you hook the person up with a buddy in the classroom. And so that's there's one student and then kind of one buddy and they're on a Google Meet. And so they're able to see what's going on in the classroom, but then they also have someone that's there to discuss the chat with or be the partner when it's partner time or work on the you know, Google Doc or Google presentation or whatever interactive part is. Um, it's worked really well in our science classes as they've had kind of um, been able to do the labs even virtually because the other person is there. And then we have some other options for our elementary students where they are getting you know, provided one-on-one um, -on -one 15 minute instruction with the information then uh, being provided virtually. Our, our middle school really likes the idea of having a video for the grade level for the subject. And so they make a video um, each week. So it's a more of an asynchronous model there. And then they have a document that they link all of the support materials the student would need um, for all of their classes. So it's a, a quick way to get to their materials. Um, but we have seen this morph, um, again, because we've had so many students that have needed to be able to access their education virtually, um, that it has seemed like we're doing hybrid, even though that is, uh, was not our intention this year. And so we've been working really hard to make sure that um, students, when they come back, that they are ready to learn and they are not um, as far behind as their peers um, as possible 
if they were not sick and they were just home um, for that length of time uh, until they could return because of a close contact. So those are our models. Um, just to kind of do a, a quick overview of, of what they were like. I'll say the successes that we had last year and that we had this year that I'm loving. Um, in our LMS, we made master classes um, for every subject or, or grade level bands. And so the teachers are building together. They are building full weeks or they are sharing their resources. And so we've really seen um, cooperation across even, you know, elementary art um, or our math classes where you might not have gotten the same level, level of collaboration in previous years. But because it's all digital, it makes it really easy for people to co-plan and also across the whole division for us to even look at our resources. So you know, there might be a platform that we use and our specialists are really working on, you know, hey, you wanna use this for this lesson and use that for that lesson to lighten the load for our teachers to be able to find the best materials. Um, also our teachers have wanted to learn. And so we love that and they want to understand the platforms better. We just had one that um, we are rolling out this week um, that was just recently purchased. And we've already had 12 teachers signed up today to want to um, kind of mini pilot it before we roll it out for everybody to see if there's any glitches that um, the couple of us that worked on it already haven't found out when we're actually interacting with students. So I've heard teachers are, they're like, we're not going back to this, but they also really learned what's good on paper and what's good digitally, or how do I need to provide this in multiple ways because I have multiple different types of learners within my platform. Um, we've seen an increase because students went out to work last year uh, in the hybrid setting. We've actually seen more families that have fought, you know, CTE or internships um, instead of taking that, you know, fourth language class, um, because they were on the college track, not that they're not going to college, but we've seen more families want to participate um, in these programs. And then also just having a discussion today on what other programs we want to provide as these are filling up. So we will still have spots for students and seeing them take multiple levels of, of building trades or electricity. Um, and that they're getting out there and getting some work experience, which is wonderful. Um, we did see an increase in parent involvement. Um, you know, everybody wants to know what their kids are doing now because, you know, they're getting a lot more communication probably from the staff. And so we've seen that our parent involvement has gone up. Those people, um, we're getting inundated about every week of, you know, hey, I want to learn how to do this. So we've had lots of parents nights for technology. Um, we have an ambassador program we're going to start. So you have a student in the building that kind of walks through our new students, um, some of the different things they should be looking for and when they come in, because we've noticed that that's a big learning curve too, is when students enter into a new building or it might be a new LMS um, and not having the teacher to have to necessarily slow down every single time there's a new student, but having someone that's a buddy or an ambassador, ambassador that can help them with that. Our other thing that I'm so excited about is um, our, you know, everybody's had to expand the LMS and their one-to-one. -one, so we are now a full one-to-one -one division, um, except for our preschool classes. But we even got them devices this year so that they can be practicing. Our middle school was so excited that when they got their students, they didn't have to teach them everything. They knew a lot of things. So we're seeing that some of the um, learning is getting shifted to elementary. And so that can be a little bit more content and engagement focused um, for our, our middle school teachers. So that was um, really excited. We even just at the beginning of the year didn't send our elementary Chromebooks home. Um, and we had to meet, we met with teachers to see what they wanted to do after about a month and a half of school was over and all of that initial testing time. Um, and we did, we had third through fifth that they, across the division, um, they wanted to be able to take the Chromebooks home for students that 
um, might be miss a day of school and need to make up something or also some of the enrichment activities that they can access on their Chromebook. Some of the challenges, our teachers are tired. <laughs> they are really tired. And so some of them are desiring that sense of normalcy because they're tired and they want that they think that going backwards might be a little bit uh, easier. Um, and so we need to make sure that that's not something um, that happens. There are some things in our previous way of life that were good. And there are some things that, you know, we just kind of need to move along. And so we are also seeing um, one of the challenges is that we still have a, a mentality of a whole group in a lot of our secondary classrooms. And because of the different um, learning areas or things that we're focused on, or they've moved from another division um, that we have had to get pretty personalized with our learning. And so that's been something that um, has we're, we're focusing on and, and doing little groups to try and figure out how can we, we do this, but then it's also, we've got to keep them separated right now. So we can't really do as much um, group work as we would like to do um, in the classrooms, um, making sure that we have follow up with all of our close contacts. And then the final is that, you know, we've got all this wonderful funding that has happened, but some of the funding has been had to use towards task. Um, so hiring people to do close contact because everybody's working around the clock, calling and checking buses, rosters, and doing things like that. Um, having someone else that can help come in um, for the clinic or run students in and out. Um, we've also had to um, get some more office staff uh, because of just some of the clerical work that comes along with the different model changes, um, the parents' needs, and also um, because of the COVID environment. And we had to hire someone just to oversee um, our elementary virtual program. So there's been a lot of places that we've seen success, but then we've also seen in some of these areas where we've had to hire more people. Um, and that could be in just instructional assistance um, in order to help for that personalized learning, but also it's little pockets there of individuals help, individual help. We've hired at several more reading specialists and interventionists at the elementary level. Uh, which are all good things, but it's not necessarily something that's bringing innovation. It is helping students though with those specific losses that they might have had uh, during um, their transition, especially in elementary school. Um, one of the things they put me to talk about is hybrid. And so hybrid, does it work? Um, we have some yeses and some noes. And so the hybrid model, again, that we used was students came to school for two days um, and then they did virtual learning for three days with one of those three days as a possible um, come to school and get some extra support. But also our online students could come and they could um, do some of the hands-on learning that they were missing as well. And so, why did we love hybrid? Um, we loved hybrid because it decreased class sizes. So every class is essentially cut in half. Um, students could work while they were absent. Students could do other things. Students could be creative. Um, and then we also had that weekly support day. So students that did need extra help or parents that wanted to bring their kids in and, and have a conference, there was always time to do that. And there was a designated time instead of trying to make schedules work um, like we do now. Some of our teachers um, who had hybrid and a virtual, um, they felt like that the hybrid was leading to extra preps because you had to have your in-person prep and then also your virtual day preps. And so trying, I feel like over time that would decrease, um, but that was something that was uh, frustrating for our staff only because you know, they're trying to do it in a COVID environment. Had it not been something that was pressed because of that, we might have had more opportunity to make it successful. Um, we also found out that a lot of our students don't complete work unless they are supervised. So those three days that they had in the hybrid environment, our students that succeed, a lot of them succeeded. Um, our students that struggle, struggled a little bit more. 
And so having them kind of thrown instead of work slowly into maybe they have an early release or something like that as, as a model um, made it so that many students were, were left at home um, or their parents were working virtually. And so they didn't have necessarily the supervision that helped them to be able to complete their work um, or their threshold uh, for frustration was just something that didn't um, meet their needs to be able to complete the work that was being provided. And then also because of that, because students would come back at all different levels uh, with all different amounts of work completed, um, the amounts of need for follow-up and remediation was, was great. And so we do have um, Saturday school, we do have tutoring done, we do have, um, we call it, it's an after school program. Um, and that's just at our secondary level. So there are lots of different ways in which we're trying to meet those needs, but they did find that there was more of them um, in the hybrid schedule that were off pace than were on pace. And again, also some of them were sick or they were out for um, COVID, even if they could have been in school, they might have missed several weeks because of that. But with all that being said, a couple of things that I think would be really would make would have make hybrid work out of our successes is limited preps for teachers. So our ones that super struggled were our singletons that had about four singleton preps. So they were teaching four different classes, which they said felt like eight. Um, so trying to figure out how to lighten that load for them. Um, and in an environment like that, the teachers don't feel like they have enough time to breathe and learn. And so stepping in to try and support them sometimes can feel like it's taking more time away from them, um, even though in the long run, they learn how to do something faster and maybe a little bit more efficient. Um, I do think that that support day for students, if you're going to do hybrid or support blocks for students, so there needs to be a day uh, in which they can come in and get some different kind of um, either extra learning or some remediation. We also, again, since we said the unsupervised students didn't necessarily work up to the degree of which they had while they were in the building, is we really need the buy-in from the community that, and the parents that this is something that um, my student's gonna do. And I saw that when I was in the virtual uh, world as well, is that you know many students don't work. Um, and then you kind of explain to their parents and you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting and all of a sudden now you know we're working again. Um, evening opportunities for tutoring was something that also brings success. If we're gonna have hybrid, we're gonna have people maybe students working during the day and they need help at night when they're doing their work. And so providing that. Also universal broadbands, um, students who do not have internet are not going to be able to be successful in the hybrid environment because they can't work from home. And so they're going to the public library or they're going out to where buses are stationed so that they can sit in their cars and work. And so that's just a very different type of environment than a student who gets to sit home and, and be in their bed or in their room um, and actually work in this. And then the other thing that was, um, is just reliance on data, really looking at your data, who are your target kids, um, what supports do they need, and making sure your systems have interoperability. I rarely try and buy anything that doesn't interoperate with our other systems. Um, and so whether that means it's a single sign-on, whether that means that it goes through the LMS, it connects to the grade book, um, are all different ways of making hybrid work because it takes some of the extra off of the teachers, off of the setup, off of learning um, for students how to get into all of their different platforms. And so my final words is just about the leadership. Um, and so I think the leadership, what we found out over the past um, you know, year and a half and even now is flexibility. Um, we have to be able to flexible. Someone said pivots, um, you know, you need to value the inputs that you have uh, and then be able to figure out what's a solution for right now. And also know that everybody knows that we're going to be, we might, we might move a little bit from where that is. And so I would continue to say that leaders need to be forward focused. Um, we need to take the data that we have. We need to take the opportunities that we have. 
we need to take the time that the state is giving us um, with some of the um, extra ways that we can be flexible within our system or within graduation credits and things like that. Um, and then also just keep trying it out. I think if we've learned nothing from the last several years is that we should just keep trying. There's lots of things. Um, and so pilot them, work through them, figure out if it does meet a need that you have. It, is it a solution that decreases time for teachers or staff? And so um, is it an idea? I know that we get emails all the time from our leadership um, and they're asking, hey, did this work? Um, we just had a, a virtual half day. So teachers had a half work day from home and then they had a half um, synchronous day uh, with students. And so we're trying that out. We just had one um, yesterday. We're gonna have a PD day, which is a virtual day um, and see you know, which way people like it. And then we get the feedback and we know what to provide moving forward. So that's my um, little overview of where I think that we've gone and where I think we are. Well, that was awesome. Um, I can hear there's been just in everything that you just relayed this, it's been <clears throat> an ongoing challenge um, and it's not done. Do you, how, how done do you feel this is? Not at all. <laughs> yeah, I think and I think the, the biggest thing right now is trying to how do we keep kids in school? Um, and so and until we see that um, students don't have to go out for close contact or things like that, that there's just there's a gap there that we can't fill and school wasn't necessarily designed uh, to meet that we're trying to figure out how to do it. Um, you know, school was kind of designed as students are there and students get learn they get learning while they're in the building. Um, and so, you know, or they're in a full virtual program and they get learning that way, but having students being in and out of the building and at any moment they can go and at any moment they can come back um, is, and making sure you're still providing learning for those students that are doing that, I think is the most difficult thing right now. Yeah. Yeah. When I talk later about models, I'm going to address sort of the elephant in the room you know, the, the teacher centricity of curriculum map. Mm -hmm. um, so that it sort of ties you to a structure. Um, and it's different than when we had the textbook days, right? So you are you still using some textbooks, even if they're digital? Um, we have some digital for our CTE. Okay. And we have some... Uh, curriculum textbooks for our um, AP classes or our dual enrollment classes, which okay. require them. Um, but everybody else, we have um, curriculum eBooks um, that are shared. So those are um, curated resources. And then also just trying to get teachers again, that collaboration that created last year that they work together on lessons. And so they're finding it. Um, and they are, we did get some readers for our elementary students and things like that. That was um, a need. So if someone did go, you could, and they didn't have um, internet capability at home, we could give them something that was an early reader for our elementary. Um, but we haven't, I don't see us going back to textbooks, but it is up to us without moving, moving towards that, we need to create the best of what we have already curated and the best of the products of which we are purchasing. So we need to find out who's using what. Um, I even had, that's a task for my librarians. They're like, well, nobody uses this product that much. I was like, well, what do you use it for? And so cataloging this year, you know, what lessons do they use that for? And then how can we make that something that we're sharing with teachers because especially new teachers trying to find all the nuances of the curriculum in multiple different places um, is something that I feel like while we don't provide a textbook, we should be, be providing that. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a little bit of an urge towards centralizing your curriculum map and having a little bit more control everywhere right now, because otherwise you've got that situation, right? Where, mm -hmm. Maybe a teacher doesn't have anything and they're, they're running around crazy trying to find the right stuff, right? Um, but we just have like, I think, two more minutes um, before. Ma Hi, Megan. 
for for Megan shares. Um, what I really love about what you said, Maureen, and I'm going to ask you more questions later when you're on the panel because I have a million. Um, is the fact that your teachers are now in this posture of massive collaboration? That is a huge culture shift. Mm-hmm. You know, teachers are like, I'm in my little con- kingdom, like my room, my classroom, right? Like, and I don't have to talk to anyone because I'm the, the king in here, a queen. Um, so to move in just a year and a half, two years to a, a culture of total collaboration is huge. Do you want to yes. comment on that? Um, I mean, I do. I think that's one of those things can be so isolating as a teacher is that you go and close your room um, and, and no one knows what you're doing unless you share what you're doing. Um, and teachers are the best stealers. I know um, we borrow, beg, steal for whatever we can get. And so yeah. I love that even though it might not be my wheelhouse to set my classroom up like this, I'm willing to try it because guess what? I don't want to make that and someone else has already done it. And so I'm actually even not seeing like beyond the collaboration, it's stretching some of our teachers because that's not the way their brain thinks to create part of the lesson, but it was already created for them and it saves them time. And so they're trying out new things or new platforms. And so I do think, um, you know, we were able to set all of this up and make it easy for them Um, So that they can actually just go, they collaborate together in one place and then they just go copy the course. And then everybody's got, it's kind of like they're building their own textbook a little bit. Um, And so they can all say, hey, how did that work for this group of kids? Or how did that work for that group of kids? And they can go back and change it right then. So it's ready for the next year, or they can take that information to be able to move forward for the next similar activity or assignment. Yeah, it's a beautiful moment in that respect, I think, Mm -hmm. right? Like, that's a real gift. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of things that you said that were super positive. So and I and I like them all. Um, But I'm going to come back to those with you. Um, So thank you for sharing. The future of work is changing. Now students are expected to graduate with a foundation in digital literacy and computer science so they can use technology, create digital artifacts, and design solutions to some of the world's biggest challenges. With Learning.com's award-winning technology curriculum, EasyTech, you and your team of educators ensure that all students are prepared for a career in computer science. Through EasyTech's scaffolded curriculum, you promote digital equity by closing the digital skills gap and giving all students access to authentic learning using technology. The content areas develop students' digital skills like keyboarding and computer fundamentals, build their proficiency in word processing, presentation, spreadsheet, and multimedia tools, and enable them to practice critical thinking and problem solving with computational thinking and design real-world solutions with coding. Across these content areas, students have hands-on and collaborative practice using digital tools and skills that are the foundation to successful technology integration in the classroom. Developed by educators like you, EasyTech has an ISTE seal of alignment and is aligned to national and state-level computer science, digital literacy, and technology standards. Your EasyTech subscription gains you access to its comprehensive curriculum, which features elements like digital lesson plans with an interactive interface that individualize learning based on student performance, hands-on and collaborative projects in which students create original digital artifacts using real software programs, pre- and post-grade-level tests designed to measure student growth, and discussion opportunities and other formative check-ins. The program saves teachers time with detailed scope and sequences, pre-built pacing calendars, and digital lesson plans. EasyTech helps your team ensure technology integration in the classroom is student-led, purposeful, and effective with adaptive content and gamified lessons that provide immediate feedback to students. EasyTech is designed for a simple implementation that enables your team to feel comfortable teaching technology even if they don't have prior experience. And with EasyTech's in-depth year-over-year reporting at the individual, classroom, school, and district level, your work is rooted in efficacy.